My name's Robbie. And this is my narrowboat, the Naughty Lass. For almost a decade, I've been exploring our canals, recording my adventures as I go. <laughs> this is incredible. This time, I'm attempting a journey of around 300 miles through the north of England and the Midlands. From Sheffield, I'll make my way up country, joining the River Trent, and then on to the Chesterfield Canal. After Lincoln, I'll travel to Nottingham, and then onwards to Leicester, before I reach Braunston, the spiritual home for narrowboaters. All filmed during the quieter and colder months of autumn and winter. I've got my plan, but my plans don't always work out. Well, nothing's on fire. It's never been this hot before. I've really worked this engine. So jump on board for my canal boat diaries. Just setting off on my adventure and it's definitely an autumnal day. And I'm dead excited really because I get to show you what it's really like living and moving a boat at this time of year. It's pretty windy, it's quite cold, I'm feeling that, but it's also beautiful with all the colours and the trees. I cannot wait to show you all the sights along the way. On this leg, I'm starting in Victoria Keys, Sheffield. I'm heading to Rotherham and Doncaster before I press on to the town of Thorn in South Yorkshire. My destination is Kidby Lock, the gateway to the Trent, about 42 miles in all. When you think about Sheffield, it's the steel city, isn't it? And one canal building that relates to that trade, that industry, is this one. It used to be called Sheaf Works. It was owned by William Greaves. And they'd actually export cutlery and razors to all over the world from right here in Sheffield. This year I'll be exploring rivers and canals. There's just going to be loads to see along the way. And I don't know what's going to happen. That's the most exciting part. I have no idea of what's going to happen. Imagine that. <laughs> I'm on the Sheffield and Tinsley Canal, just going through Bacon Lane Bridge. And I've just got to show you this little area because this is where they filmed the full Monty. You've seen the full Monty? This is the scene where they have to jump on a submerged car because they've just nicked some scrap metal from the factories over here. It's a long time since it was filmed, back in 1997, so uh, a lot of the area has changed since. When the Sheffield and Tinsley first opened, a general holiday was called. And crowds gathered to watch a flotilla of barges carrying coal to the city. A lot has changed in the last year, and not all of it's been good, I'm afraid to tell you. I had a relationship that unfortunately had to break up and so I moved back on board the boat full time, which was a good thing, you know, I, I liked being in my boat and I wasn't happy and maybe that was because of all the going backwards and forwards, dry land to boat. I'd love to say that I've got a fairy tale life and everything works out right but unfortunately that's not the, not the reality. But 
you've just got to keep moving forward, haven't you? I've got a minor issue here. Got to the first lock, and already I've lost something from my boat. The end of a tiller pin. Nice little wooden bit. Ah, there it is. <laughs> yes, got it. <laughs> this isn't ideal, really. In the middle of a lock, having to make some repairs. But it's got to be done. Well, that, I think, just about does it. Right. The Tinsley flight is a hard graft. 11 broad but relatively short locks. Built to accommodate Yorkshire keels that worked this waterway. I can't believe this. Right underneath the M1, underneath double decker viaduct, and I've got something wrapped around the propeller. That old one. So let's see what it is. I mean, it wouldn't be Canal Boat Diaries without something getting wrapped around the propeller. Right, I'm gonna have to get in there, chop all that out. Not only is a load of weed down there, but also I'm drifting down the canal <laughs> with the wind, so. Uh, I better do this quickly. <sighs> yeah, that is all clear now. about six o'clock, the sun's going down. I need to find a mooring pretty quickly. And I think I've found the right spot. This is actually my 10th year traveling around on the canals which feels like quite an achievement. Starting out on a friend's boat in London. I don't think I could have predicted that I would still be doing this a decade later, but I'm really glad I am because I found this lifestyle that suits me. Traditional brass bands have played an important role in working class Yorkshire communities. And Rotherham is a place proud of its brass. This is Clifton Park that I'm in right now, and I want to show you this bandstand. Not only does it look great amongst all these trees that are turning colour, it's important because there were collieries and steelworks where it was really popular to have a brass band. It was a thing of real civic pride. And this was built in 1928. It's seen hundreds of performances. And I just think it looks amazing.
going into Eastwood Lock now. This is quite a large one. It's uh, electric as well. It was built in 1983 to serve 700 tonne barges, so that's why we've got control tower and everything's automated. This is crazy, so what we're doing is opening the lock just by using this panel here. So I've got all these lights that tell me when I can do certain things. So obviously everything's automatic, but you've still got to be on high alert, because, uh, yeah, things can still go wrong in these locks. From here, I join the River Don navigation and press on to Connorsborough. It's quite difficult to get stuff sent to where I am because I'm always on the move. I don't have an address. And although you can pick parcels up at lockers, you know, outside a supermarket, for me, I'm moving pretty much every day at the moment. Ooh, new kettle. So I've got some parcels that I've ordered online, got them sent to my producer who's visiting me today. Cool. Hello, new kettle. Very nice. During the 20th century, improvements were made to locks along the Don so it could handle bigger boats but here and there are reminders of the old waterway. Now obviously, this is the 1980s new improved locks, much bigger. But I want to show you what the old ones used to look like before they modernised the navigation. Much smaller than the one I'm in right now. And uh, yeah, full of weeds. But it's so interesting to see the original route of the navigation coming through here and imagining what that would have looked like. Many of these changes came too late in the day. By the 80s, much of the freight had moved to road and rail. Just passing Waddington's boatyard, for over 200 years, boats have been maintained here. And it was the home of the king of the canals, Vic Waddington, who inherited the family business and over 75 years turned it into a multi-million pound canal fleet. Vic passed away in the 90s. And while his former yard remains, most of his boats are long gone. Further up the cut, there's a relic from another industry. At the top there, you can see a winch that would have been used to load and offload from boats. And although it's derelict now, they were milling flour here until the 1970s. Owning an old boat like this, it's got a lot of problems that I don't really understand. You know, I don't know when certain things need to be repaired, how long things will actually last. So there's a lot of guessing involved, really. Just setting off, and um, I realise there's a problem with my engine. The oil pressure gauge is going all over the place, which means it's lost oil pressure. I've had this problem before, 
in this exact same location <laughs> five years ago. I can't believe this. I found a nut that's loose on the actual oil switch itself and I'm just tightening it up. Once I'd gone through all the troubleshooting, I realised oh, all it is is a little tiny nut that I have to just tighten. So I was absolutely buzzing when I could fix it myself because, uh, yeah, often I'd have to just call someone in to fix it for me. Fixing an engine problem, I wouldn't have had a clue about years ago. And now I feel amazing that I've actually fixed it myself. But it's even better now. We've got some nice weather. Getting back out onto the river, we get to see an incredible viaduct and a castle as well. So we've got some sights to show you today. Reminders of the golden age of knights in armour, this picturesque ruin inspired Sir Walter Scott's most famous novel, Ivanhoe, published in 1819. <laughs> this is incredible. Twenty-one arches this viaduct has got, with 15 million bricks, spanning 1,500 feet. They apparently, to build this, they used an aerial ropeway, if you can imagine such a thing, to get the men and materials across the valley. God, you've got to love heights for that, haven't you? It's absolutely insane. From here, I've got about 25 miles to go. I'll stop in Doncaster and then head on to Thorn before I reach Kidby Junction, then onto the Trent. Right, I'm just coming into Doncaster now. I'm gonna moor here for a few days, get some jobs done, and uh, just take in all the sights, basically. My lifestyle on this boat affords me not too much in terms of wealth, financial wealth, but it uh, definitely gives me a lot of time so I can moor up somewhere and just explore. Oh, that's lovely. Thank you very much. Wow. My mooring in Doncaster is really handy. I can get all my supplies. It's so close to everything here. There's a laundrette I can use. And although I've been to Doncaster many times before, there always seems to be something new. Right, that's it, Doncaster, on to the next destination, which for me is Thorn. Still in South Yorkshire, but we're gonna take a turning onto a different canal, the Stainforth and Kidby Canal. The reason I love to travel these lesser known waterways is they're not the Grand Union, they're not the Clangochlan. 
they're not all these popular canals that people choose to cruise in the busier months. And especially now that it's less busy, I've got this all to myself in a way. But it's not long until I'm joined by another boat. Not a pleasure cruiser, a working vessel. The wake that comes off that thing. Whew, colossal. <laughs> but what a sight, it's so good to see a commercial vessel still using these waterways as they were made for. Just going into this lock, and this is something I've never seen anywhere else in the system. I might be wrong about this, but this could be the only lock with a pump out machine in it, which for those in the know means I can empty my toilet. Let's just hope no one's coming the other way. The reason I'm racing on this is that you only get about eight minutes. Oh. <laughs> and sometimes they don't work like you expect them to. I've just had a load of wee and poo just spurt all over me. Brilliant. <laughs> well, at least it's working. Cost of living, I mean, it's an issue for everyone, isn't it? I do earn a living from making these films. I mean, this boat, I've had it for seven years and I, I can't afford to upgrade. I can't afford to make huge changes. I haven't got a lot here. Um, I've got just enough, you know, I, I, I'm happy. I'm content with what I've got because I have to be. I can't afford much else. Bramworth Junction, I'm heading right to join the Stainforth and Kidby Canal. Boats originally navigated tidal waters with fast flowing currents until the canal opened in 1802. This area, like many in Yorkshire, shows the intrinsic link between waterways and coal mining, but not a lot of that heritage is left, apart from headstocks one and two, which are listed structures from the local Hatfield, Maine colliery. By the beginning of the 1920s, Hatfield was in full production and the canal provided access to the Humber and a way to transport coal. Just coming into Thorn now, it's about 3 p.m. So, make good progress today. Ah, result, there is a space just for me. Isn't that nice? This is a great morning, this. An evening here means I can grab a bag of coal for my stove. Thorn was once a centre for boat building, with ropes and rigging made in the town. Today, the industry continues, however, on a much smaller scale. It's 
7 a.m. I'm trying to speak quietly because I'm the first one up this morning, but I need to try and make a sliding railway bridge today. It only opens at a certain time of day, so I've got to leave now, get through about six moving bridges along nine miles of canal. It's not very often that I will set off in the dark, especially on a cold autumn morning. leaving South Yorkshire, heading on into North Lincolnshire now. But this used to be wet, marshy bogland until they improved the drainage. And we're bordered in this area by the North and South Soak. But it's great. I love how, uh, although it's really, really flat, the sky suddenly becomes really, really big. You can see for miles on a good day. <laughs> I'm here, I've made it. I'm just going to moor up now and wait for my turn to go through this sliding railway bridge. Right, the last train has just passed over the bridge. And now they're going to open it. Here we go. A sliding bridge was first built here for the Great Central Railway's Scunthorpe Line in 1925. It was later replaced by this newer version. so odd, the whole of the bridge just completely moved out of the way. Awesome. Since leaving Sheffield about a week ago, I've travelled over 42 miles, taking on 26 locks. I've had loads of challenges, but this is it. It's my destination at Kidby Lock where I get ready for the next part of my adventure that takes me out onto the Tidal River Trent.